join in with Scott in welcoming everybody here this morning. We do have a good crowd that is with us. We have some visitors. We also have some of our members. We also have some very sunburnt members that are back with us. It's good to see them as well. I'm sure they're a little bit tired. I told Nathan, I think he landed. They landed at about five or six this morning. I said this long is going to, or this sermon is going to be three things. It's going to be long. It's going to be boring. And it's going to be very, very, very repetitive. So if you see him start to nod off, just know that that's planned. That's what the whole thing was geared towards. I don't think it's too arrogant of me to say that I believe that we live in the greatest nation that this world has ever seen. And I don't just mean in this time period. I don't just mean in 2016 that we live in the greatest nation that this that is on this world at this point in time. Certainly when you compare it to things that are going on across the nation or across the world, it's easy to see things and think to ourselves, I'm glad I'm not that country. I'm glad I don't live there. But when I say I think that we are the greatest nation that's ever existed, I mean comparatively according to history, whether you put Rome or whether you put the early stages of Britannia, whether you put all these different nations, no matter what continent, no matter what time period, I believe that we live in the greatest nation that the world has ever seen. And I say that very unashamedly. We have a great, we have freedoms of speech, we have freedoms of, I would say guns, but I don't want to go in that direction. We have freedom of religion. We have the ability to peacefully assemble. We have... And I know it's had its faults at times. We have a government that historically has been fantastic, especially when you compare it to governments of other nations. And so when I say that we live in not only just a, a privileged time period, but I mean when we live in a privileged country, I actually mean that. I am so proud to be an American. I love the fact that we still say the Pledge of Allegiance. I love the fact that people still put their hands over the heart when the national anthem is sung. I love the fact that we live in this country. And as much as we look at the rest of the nation, we think to ourselves, or the rest of the world, and think to ourselves how great it are is compared to them, certain events happen sometimes that bring us really back to reality. And I think 9-11 was one of those times. 9-11 for me was one of those moments, and I don't know what you were doing, I was about 13, 14 years old, sitting in Mr. Miller's English class when all that stuff happened. And as we're watching on the news, as we're watching those twin towers go down, they played replay after replay throughout the course of that entire day. They showed all these replays of those planes going into those twin towers, and then eventually those towers falling. All you can think of over and over again is what is happening to our country, the country that we love, the country that we've been, most of us have been born into, the country that we've come to appreciate, the country that we love and respect so much, all of a sudden is under attack. One of the greatest losses of life on American soil in history is unfolding right before our eyes. And the question becomes when moments like this happen, what is our country coming towards? 250 years ago, Samuel Johnson, who was around at the time of the founding fathers, had this to say. He said, adversity has ever been considered the state in which a man most easily becomes acquainted with himself. And it was at this point in time when all these towers were falling and all these questions were going, the questions that were raging was, what kind of country are we? Are we a country that puts so much dependence on this instance? We're obviously representing much of the financial strength that our country has that we look at those towers falling and we think to ourselves, our country literally is in shambles. Or are we going to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and are we going to push forward? What kind of country are we? What kind of country have we become? The answer to all these questions, at least in my opinion, is the questions about what country is it and what country will become. The answer to all these questions lies in a very far off place in that. It lies in the home. The answer to the question of what kind of country are we, the answer to the question of how are we going to respond to this, the answer to the question of who are we really at our core, all of it starts way back at the beginning. And what kind of country we are within each individual home that is represented within this nation. As I was sitting there on 9-11 that evening as we were eating dinner, and we always watch TV at dinner, we always talk about things that were going on. And especially I remember my dad talking to us about 9-11, and he was asking us, he was asking me and my middle brother, my oldest brother was away, he was married, he's 11 years old with me, so he's off, but it was me and my middle brother and my mom, he was asking us, what does this mean to you? What do you think is going to be the future for us? And we all kind of gave our own little responses. And I'll never forget something that he said on 9-11 that night. He said, we will overcome this. And I don't know what happened at your family dinner. I don't know what conversations happened at that point. But I know in my family, in this moment, in time of adversity, I knew at least for the Cook family, we were going to overcome. We are going to move past this. We were not going to let, as President Bush said at that point, we were not going to let terrorists destroy our sense of terror, our sense of safety, our sense of confidence in our country. But all of those things start, and all of those happiness, that sense of security, and all that sense of resilience, all of that happens on a microscopic level within the four walls of your home and what kind of house you construct. 
your family. It was with this in mind that Mother Teresa, the woman who just became a saint according to the terms of the Catholic Church, Mother Teresa had this to say. She said, if you want to change the world, go home first and love your family. Because what Mother Teresa, as she's called, what Mother Teresa understood was is that if you want to affect change on a nationwide, on a global level, on a huge level, it starts, begins, and ends with what you do with your family in your home. That's where it all begins in the first place. Ronald Reagan seeing this, and I know everybody here is huge fans of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan in 1987 issued Executive Order 12606, which described all the different questions that legislators must ask, ask themselves before they enacted any period of legislation. There's seven different ones on there, but these are the top three. And he asked the question, does this action by government strengthen or erode the stability of the family and particularly the marital commitment? Does this action strengthen or erode the authority and the rights of parents in the education, nurture, and supervision of their children? Does this action help the family perform its functions, or does it substitute government activity for the function? He has four more questions after that. But as he's looking at all these different pieces of legislation, the overarching theme of all those questions is, how does this piece of legislation affect the family on a nuclear level? How does this affect the family in the Midwest who's struggling to get by? How does this affect the family on the East Coast that whose dad is gone all the time as he's traveling for business? How does it affect all these different families? These are the questions that we have to ask ourselves. When David said in the book of Psalms, when he said, Righteousness exalted a nation, which is the title for our lesson this morning. When he said that, he talked about how righteousness is the thing that brings a nation up. What he meant with that was that righteous, righteousness begins in the core level and spreads out to exalt a nation. So let me ask you the question. What kind of home are you preparing for your family? How do we respond to events like this? How do we respond to events in our own lives? We look at it and we say to ourselves, I don't know how I'm going to overcome this. I don't know how I'm going to get moved past this. But I know that we'll find a way. What kind of home are you preparing for your family? What kind of home is present within your family? Is it a home, for instance, where God is on? Is your home a place where God is respected, where he is revered, where he is honored, where he is cherished as the caretaker, the provider of all things? I understand that the parents have a huge role in that, obviously, but is God honored within your home? It's always been interesting to me that Abraham is talked about as being the father of many nations. And if we just kind of move past that, the common assumption to that is, well, Abraham's called the father of many nations because genealogically, every Jewish person descends out of Abraham. That's the way that we commonly describe it. That he's the father of many nations simply because it was from him that every Jew originated in the first place. That's not the reason, at least not the only reason, that he's described as the father of many nations. In Genesis, the 18th chapter, starting in verse 16, as the angels come to visit Abraham and Lot, and then they go back down to Sodom, that whole instance. Genesis chapter 18, starting in verse 16, talking about the men rose up from there, looking down towards Sodom, Abraham was walking with them to send them off. So you have Abraham walking with these two visitors that we know to be angels. In verse 17, the Lord says, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed, reflecting the promises that he had made to Abraham. But listen to this in verse 19. For I have chosen him, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. As God is looking at Abraham, especially as his angels are walking alongside Abraham, they're going down towards Saul, they're going down towards Lot, God is having this discussion, I think, given to us because of our benefit, not simply because God just said they're talking to himself. But God looks at Abraham and says, I'm not going to hide what it is that I'm going to do to this nation anymore because Abraham is the one that should know everything, at least within certain bounds. And he says the role of Abraham, specifically within this promise of the father of many nations, having a great nation that descends from him, the whole focal point of Abraham is not that his seed is going to be powerful and spread all corners of the earth. The whole point of Abraham, or God saying that about Abraham, is Abraham is going to be the one that will teach his children, who will then teach their grandchildren, who will then teach his great-grandchildren, that the Lord is true and how to follow him. That was the role of Abraham. And when you think about him being the father of many nations, it's not just genealogically. It has everything to do with him being a metaphorical father by sharing down the righteousness and the holiness and the goodness of God to every generation that proceeds forth from him. That's the role of Abraham as the father of many nations. To you, I say the same thing to you. 
that whether you're a father, whether you're a grandfather, whether you're single, whether you're going to have kids someday, or whatever the situation is, is that how you perceive your role within the family? Not simply to bring home the bacon, which I love bacon, there's nothing wrong with bacon, but not simply to bring home the bacon, but is or do you perceive your role as being the spiritual leader of that household? Because if not, you need to re-examine what your whole purpose is in that department. Carrying this idea forward, when you look at the next book, in Exodus, the 13th chapter, you look at how this kind of idea played out, especially within the lives of the Jews, you can see this reflected in the thoughts of God later as he's talking about all the different things that would happen, especially within the rituals. Exodus chapter 13, starting in verse 11. It says, Now when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanite, as he swore to you and to your fathers and gives it to you, you shall devote to the Lord the first spring of the offspring of every womb, and the first offspring of every beast that you own, the males belong with the Lord. And then it starts to get a little weird. Verse 13, but every first offspring of a donkey you shall redeem with the lamb, but if you don't redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. It's a very weird scenario. Obviously, it's talking about the sacrifice. That's a very strange setting if you don't know the context. And so God, anticipating that this would raise questions, look immediately what he says there in verse 14. It shall be that when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is this? Which they will ask when they eventually see their father killing the firstborn. Why are we killing this one? There's other lambs, there's other oxen. Why can't we kill the other ones? It says, when you says, when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is this? That's when you shall say to him, with a powerful hand the Lord brought us out, out of Egypt from the house of slavery. And it came about, verse 15, that when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed every firstborn of the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man, the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord the males, the first offspring of every womb, but every firstborn of my sons I redeem. The question is going to come about eventually as your child looks up at you and sees that you're giving the firstborn, the best of your flock, that you're giving it to God. The question is going to come up. Why are you doing that? There's other oxen. There's other land. There's other animals. Let's give ten oxen because this one is far superior to all the other ten. Why are you giving this one? And what God says there in Exodus, the 13th chapter, is when, you, when your son asks you that question about why you're giving that one, you tell him that it's because the Lord brought us out with a mighty hand, a powerful hand. And that when Pharaoh did not want us to go, that's when God issued plagues to tell him and command him and to show him his power. And that God freed us from the throes of slavery, that he would bring us into a land that he had promised to us a long time ago. It may be, and I don't, I don't obviously I didn't talk to everybody, we're not doing surveys or anything, but it may have been this morning that you woke up and you talked to your kid or you talked to your wife or whatever the situation is, and you said, we're going to church this morning. As all of us, at least to my knowledge, my vision, have the reputation, have the habit of doing it. There may be a point where they say, well, why are we going today? I'm tired, I feel good, we've stayed up late last night, let's just go next week. After all, going to services really isn't that important. Or maybe you're explaining it to your son, who's 8, 19 years old. He's starting to come into a knowledge of Jesus, starting to come into a knowledge of God. And he asks you, why are we going to church every single Sunday? And you can say to him all sorts of different things. You can say to him, it's because it's what we do, which is, I've heard a few times growing up, I didn't hear a lot, but I heard that from time to time. It's because of what we do, right? You just get in the car. Other times it may have been, well, it's because we want to worship God, it's because we want to serve him, which is a better reason. You should try this one out for a change. And say to him, because the Lord sent his son to die for our sins, and we're going to services so that we can worship, and we can honor, and we can praise him. Give the child a reason for that. And help him to understand exactly who God is, and what his role is within your life. Rather than just saying, well, it's because it's our habit, or we feel like it, or we're just used to doing that type of thing. Giving them a reason, and understanding at first within ourselves, why we go to services in the first place. God didn't anticipate, or God anticipated that people would ask questions, and he gave them a reason for that hope that was within them. Let me ask you another question. Is your home a place where purity reigns? You don't have to look too far. Actually, you could stay within your couch, or stay on your couch, and just look at your phone, and look on Facebook, and you can see how immoral this nation has become. You don't have to look too far to see all the abominations that are happening in this world, where fornication is running rampant, and adultery is actually... The norm for whatever reason. I actually read an article the other day that asked the question, I'm saying this verbatim from the headline of the article, said, is adultery such a bad thing? The fact that we're even asking that question as a society blows my mind. 
And the idea that immorality is rampant and it's all over the place and people are doing whatever they want with whoever they want, they're acting however they want, that shouldn't shock anybody. But your home and my home should be a place not only where that's not tolerated, because it's easy to take things out of the equation, it should be a place where purity is enforced, where it's encouraged. But we're not just removing activities from the household saying, you can't do this, 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 or this, which I can actually do that with my hand now, where you can't do this, 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 or this. You can't do those things, but where purity and integrity, character, righteousness, honor, those things are encouraged. So I ask you the question, as we're talking about this this morning, is your place, or is your home a place where purity is encouraged, not just immorality outlawed? Does purity matter to you and your family? But purity is not just the absence of immorality. That's how we tend to phrase it. But purity is not just the absence of immorality. It's also the presence, the presence of virtues. The presence of righteousness. The presence of holiness. The presence of chastity. All those things go within that. I'll ask you the question. Is your home a place where purity is encouraged? It probably shouldn't surprise us that of all the things that David did, and he was fantastic at, David the king, being a father was not one. David was a horrible father. By all intents and purposes. And we're going to talk about another battle here in a second. But David was fantastic in so many ways. The one thing that he did not do is set a very good example for his kids. Let's look at Psalm 63. We're going to look at Psalm 63 and then go back to 1 Kings chapter 2. We'll look at first, look first to Psalm 63. I know 1 Kings is up there. Look at Psalm 63. I want you to notice the passion that David has in his life. Psalm 63, starting. In verse 1. Listen to what David has to say concerning his own relationship with God. In Psalm 63, starting in verse 1, he says, O oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water, thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory, because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you, as he did through numerous psalms. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. If you don't think he can get any more or have any more superlatives, look further. Look at verse 6. He says, When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you, and your right hand upholds me. David was fantastic in his own personal relationship with God. Because as he sinned with Bathsheba and Nathan brought that to his attention, he penned Psalm 51, which is a beautiful psalm of repentance. And when David was standing there looking at Goliath on the other side of the brook, and he looked at him and saw how Goliath was taunting nations of Israel, he's the one that stood up and defended God. And when the nation of the Philistines were running ramshod all over everything regarding Israel, he was the one that led his army in battle and battle and victory after victory all over the nations of the heathens. David's relationship with God was fantastic on numerous levels, as evidenced by Psalm 63. But that same David, who was engaging himself in battles, who was winning victories over Goliath, who was... And even in his later years, still commanding the army. He fell woefully short when it came to providing an example for his own children. And he had to sit by and watch not just Absalom go nuts. He had to sit there and watch Amnon rape his half-sister. And he had to also bear in mind the fact that Nathan told him at some point, or after Bathsheba, that sin with Bathsheba, that the sword would never depart from his house. And as David probably reflected back on his failures as a father and saying, I wish I had done this, wish I had done this, I wish I had encouraged him in this, my relationship with God was great, but theirs were not. As he's reflecting back on this, you can see David at some point coming to a knowledge of where he fell short. Because in 1 Kings chapter 2, you see David sharing something with his son Saul. Look in 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Fantastic piece of advice from a guy who probably should have told his son that much earlier in life. He said, as David's time to draw, die draw near, he charged Saul and his son, saying, I am going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. That phrase is repeated in the New Testament. He says, keep the charge of the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn. 
So that the Lord may carry out his promise, which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart, with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. And what David brings to Solomon's mind is not just obedience for obedience sake. Be the man of God that you need to be. But have a relationship with God that is rooted within obedience so that our family line can continue. David said that when he was about to die. David should have lived that and communicated it to his son much earlier in life. Before Solomon probably heard about his father's indiscretions with Bathsheba. And not to get too psychoanalytical here, but probably impacted his relationships with the 900 plus women that he was married to and had relations with later in his life. David should have been the model of chastity that he preached to his son right before he died, encouraging him to be a man of God, to quit yourself like a man, as some translations would say, and stand up and be an example. So this, I ask you the question. Is your home, is my home a place for purity and courage? Not just immorality is outlawed and we don't want you to do these things, but is your home a place for purity and chastity and righteousness and all the virtues are encouraged as a family, as David should? I ask you also, is your home a place where prayer is encouraged? This may come somewhat of a taboo subject because prayer is always so personal when it comes to us. Because we like to think that we pray to God and we have, we have a regular prayer life, whatever that consists of, one, two, five times a day, a hundred times a day, whatever it is. And so for us to ask the question, is prayer encouraged my household? The obvious answer is yes. Because after all, before dinner, before lunch, we always pray. We have those little aerial prayers that we shoot up, thanking God for our food. We always have those prayers. But is your home a place where prayer on a daily, regular, 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 I'm just kidding, stuff like that encouraged? I've only been a father for ten and a half months, which is about a billion months shy of probably most of everybody else here. I understand that I'm very new when it comes to this part. But as I've seen Logan grow up, and I see him start to become more independent. He's starting to stand up on the coffee table. He's starting to chew on the coffee table, which is annoying to his mother. I like it personally. But as he's walking around his little walker and he's playing bumper cars with all the different chairs and stuff, I can see him progressively becoming more independent. And as I see him becoming more independent, the one thought that I always have is, I hope, as I love the fact that he's becoming more independent, but I hope Logan never gets to a point where he outgrows me, where he doesn't need me. Now I understand he's going to have his own life, he's going to do his own things, he's going to live outside of the walls of our house that him and that me and Melinda have. I understand that. But I don't ever want Logan to get to a point where he outgrows me, where he doesn't come to me for help, come to me for advice. He can come to me for money if he wants to. I'm going to be a whole lot there probably by the time he's old, but... He can come for anything he wants to. I fear sometimes when it comes to our relationship with God, we get to a point where we don't really need him anymore. Where we feel like we outgrow him. And when our kids come to us with issues, or even when we have issues, we may think to go to God eventually, but it's not really at the top of our mind. It's not really at the forefront of our heart. And whenever we're talking at things around the dinner table, we're talking amongst our family, sitting on the couch, or whatever it is, and our son or our wife comes up to us and says, what about this? Or I'm worried about this. Here's sometimes that our very last thought is, you should pray to God about that. That's it. You just need to go to God in prayer and ask Him for help. Ask Him for advice. Because we think to ourselves, either I have all the answers, or God surely doesn't have all the answers. I fear sometimes that over, after a while, we begin to outgrow God. Psalm 127. I encourage you to look at this. David reflects back on his relationship. We talked about him a second ago. Psalm 127. This is what David has to say here. Some of these verses will become very familiar to you. It's only five verses long, but it's a lot in these. Psalm 127 has this to say. In verse 1, he says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. That's a phrase that's common to a lot of people. I've seen it up on people's homes. He says, unless the, Lord, unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. So that's who he's talking about when he's mentioned the verse 2. The person who is not searching after God. He says there in verse 2, if the Lord doesn't build the house, then verse 2, it's vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives his beloved, or he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. The relationship that somebody has with God, or the relationship that somebody has when their relationship is with God, an obedient relationship with God, far surpasses anything else wise. 
If somebody has a nominal relationship with God and says, well, I believe in him a little bit, I'll worship him on Sunday, but he's not really a part of my life Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, not really a huge part of my life. Then our relationship with him is nominal in nature. And he doesn't build our house. He's not the one that's the architect of our home and of our family structure. And what he mentions here in verses 1 and 2, he piggybacks all of this here in verses 3 through 5 by talking about the blessedness of children but raising them in the way that God would want us to. He says, Beloved children are a gift of the war. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. If you are raising your family the way that you should, and if you are providing this model of godliness as the head of the household for the rest of your family, the model. Asking these questions regardless. When we're studying with our children, do we tell them, we're studying the Bible, when we study the Bible with our children, do we tell them to ask God for the answers to their questions? When they're bullied at school, do we tell them to pray for God for strength and courage? Now here's some other questions. These are a little bit deeper. Do our kids see us pray? Can our family tell that the pre meal prayer is important and actually means something? Does my wife see me as a spiritual leader of the household? All these questions, it doesn't matter if you are married, if you're single, if you have kids, if you have grandkids, whatever your situation is. If you're a person, all of those questions apply to you. Because if you are single, living in an apartment by yourself, that's your house, that's your household. Are you the spiritual leader of that household? Do you model righteousness for yourself? And if all these answers to these questions, as you search and perspectively to yourself, if the answers to all these questions is no, then ask yourself the reason. Why not? Why do my kids not see me as a spiritual leader of my house? Why does my wife not talk to me about biblical things? Why does my husband not ever once feel compelled to pray? All these are questions we have to ask ourselves as we search our souls and ask ourselves if we really do have that relationship with God that we think we do. Or if we're just fooling ourselves. Finally, is my place or my home a place where sin is disciplined? I don't want to go off the deep end on this on the other side and say to ourselves, well, what we need to do is we need to discipline our kids all the time and never let them sit on the couch. Just, you know, beat them so bad they can't even sit straight. That's not what I'm getting at here. Because I understand full well that we need to show our children, and we need to represent a God to our children that is loving, that is patient, that is kind, and that is long-lasting in regards to our life. That He will always be there with us. That's the God that we need to present. But we can't represent that God to our family at the expense of the one that serves justice. As the one that is right. As the one that is honorable. As the one that will judge every man at the end of time. 1 Samuel chapter 22, if you would, turn up into that. Talked about how David wasn't the model father. Eli far surpasses him in terms of absentee's father. And in 1 Samuel chapter 22, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 2, not 22. I was wondering why we were looking at the priest slain. Oh, that didn't make any sense. 1 Samuel chapter 2, starting in verse 22. Eli, of course, is the high priest which shows you the level of maturity that he should have. First second chapter 2, starting verse 22, it says, Now Eli was very old, and he heard that all his sons were doing to Israel, how they lay with the women who served at the door of the tent of meeting. And he said to them, talking Eli to his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, he said to them, Why do you do such things, the evil things that I hear from all these people? No, my sons, for the report is not good which I hear the Lord's people circulating. If one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? And here's where you see the reflection of how awful these kids really are when it says they wouldn't listen to the voice of their father for the Lord desired to put them to, bed, to death. Verse 26 provides a nice or nice light within Eli's life. When it says here in verse 26, the boy Samuel, however, was growing in stature and in favor both with the Lord and with men. Flashback to Hophni and Phinehas in verse 27, and you can see just how bad these people actually were. It says that a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt and bondage to Pharaoh's house? 
Did I not choose them from all the tribes of Israel to be my priests, to go to my altar, to burn incense, to carry an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the fire offerings of the sons of Israel, all these blessings and duties and responsibilities that he gave to the high priest? Verse 29, why do you kick at my sacrifice? And at my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choicest of every offering of my people Israel. Did you catch that? That what God said to Eli was that Eli regarded his own sons above the Lord. That's the charge that the man of God gives to him. Therefore, in verse 30, the Lord of God Israel declares, I did indeed say that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me, and for those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will break your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. You will see the distress of my will. In spite of all the good that I do for Israel, and an old man will not be in your house forever. It will not cut off every man of yours from my altar, so that your eyes will fail from weeping, and your soul should grieve. And all the increase of your house will die in the prime of life. Verse 34, this will be the sign to you that will pain come concerning your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, on the same day, both of them will die. But I will raise up for myself a faithful priest, who will do according to what is in my heart and my soul. I will build him an enduring house, and he will walk before my anointed always. I want you to think for a second. Put yourself in the shoes of Eli as he sits there and listens to this judgment come up. Eli is fully aware of what his sons are up to. He knows that they're blatantly immoral. He knows that they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And as the man of God points out, he esteems his sons over the Lord. And he is fully cognizant of all of this. And the judgment that comes down from God towards Eli is, both of your sons on the same day are going to die. Imagine that. And then moreover than that, your family line will stop. You will not have a person that serves on that throne anymore. <coughs> Moreover than that, you're going to see all this distress right in front of your eyes. Can you imagine the pain that Eli must have felt at this point in time? Maybe it's unfair for you to talk about disciplining your kids. After all, the, the worst thing Logan does is he reaches out for the light socket when he shouldn't, or for the electrical socket when he shouldn't. Sock his hand. That's about the worst that Logan does right now. And I don't know there is everything there is to know about displaying your children. I wouldn't presume to know everything that there is to know about displaying your children. Let me say this. I hope that I will discipline him the way that he should go so that I don't ever find myself in you like shoes. And I don't ever find myself in the shoes of Aaron, who after Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire before God, had to watch as God burnt his sons to death right in front of him, and then was given a strict command by God not to weep at all for his kids. And I hope that I never have to sit there and watch on Judgment Day as my kids go along with the goats, as God separates the sheep from the goats. I don't know everything there is to know about disciplining your kids. And I, don't, I don't presume to know everything there is to know about disciplining your kids. But my prayer always is that I will do enough and that we will do enough. I don't want to exclude Moina from this situation. That we will do enough. We will never, ever, ever have to sit in the shoes of watching our kids go away to eternal destruction. That's not a position that I would be in. So ask yourself the question, are you starting with that now? Are you not only teaching your kids about the love and the grace and the hospitality and the, the overwhelming abundance of hope that God gives your children? But you're also making them aware of the fact that God is just, and that He is true, and that He is straight to His word. Are we presenting both sides of that? General Omar Bradley, who was one of the last five-star generals and served in World War II, had a fantastic quote. This is a guy who has seen just about everything in life. He said, America today is running on the momentum of a godly ancestry. And when that momentum runs down, God help America. We have grasped, I love this phrase, we have grasped the mystery of the Adam and rejected the Sermon on the Mount. The world has achieved brilliance without conscience. Ours is a world of nuclear giants, ethical infants. You may be raising your family in the most fantastic way possible. Your kids are rocket scientists, your husband is a CEO of his company, and all the greatest things that this world can ever give you, you have in your family. And if that's the case, 
And more power to you. Well, let me end with what Jesus had to say. What profit is a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? What kind of home are you providing for your family? What kind of house are you raising your children in? What kind of home am I providing for my family? These are questions that all of us should be asking. No matter what your situation is in life, no matter what you do, no matter how many people occupy your family, the questions all of us should be asking every single day of our life. And if we can help you in any way, the people that are present here this morning can help you in any way with that. Won't you come as we say it God give us Christian homes, homes where the fire